Hi there everyone. Lately on Objectivity you've probably seen us talking about the moon and planets and things like that. Quite modern by our standards. We've looked yeah. at Apollo moon rocks and Russian moon dust. So Keith Moore here at the Royal Society has brought me down to the book room because he wants to take me further back in time for another talk about the moon. And we've yes. got three books. Look at them. They look like brothers or something, don't mm. they? They all look quite similar to each other. Yeah. Well, they're all slightly different, but they're all linked by, well, what did people think about the moon and other planets back in the 17th and an early 18th century? They knew them through telescopes, of course, but how did they think they would get there? What did they think they would find when they arrived? This is a discovery of a new world by Bishop John Wilkins, a very early fellow of the Royal Society. And here he's taking a look at the moon and speculating on whether it's inhabited. Well, for our purpose, more importantly, how do you get there? That's actually an abbreviated title though, isn't mm, it? I prefer yeah. the full title. Let's get the full title. Oh, hang on a second, look at that. Gorgeous. There's a lot going on there, isn't there? Hmm. And you can see who the characters are. Oh yeah. We've got Copernicus and Galileo mm -hmm. and Kepler. Is that Kepler like, looking over Galileo's yeah, shoulder? Yeah, whispering in his ear. That's a bit odd, isn't it? And then we have the little solar system model there, and we've got, there's the Earth with the moon. And you can see it's printed in London in 1683. 1683. If only they knew what was coming. Here we go. A discovery of a new world or... A discourse tending to prove that tis probable there may be another habitable world in the moon. And it continues. <laughs> With a discourse concerning the probability of a passage thither, onto which is added a discourse concerning a new planet, tending to prove that tis probable our Earth is one of the planets. Wow, the Earth is a planet. Got that one right. Got that one right. And the key thing there is a discourse concerning the probability of a passage through the... Can we get to the moon? Mm. Can it happen? So this is a really interesting book and there's lots of interesting chapters and propositions and all sorts mm. of things. Yeah. Actually, here are all the propositions. For example, proposition four, that the moon is a solid, compacted, opacious body. Yeah. Didn't so even know that. What is it they can see it, but, but what's it made of? Proposition five, that the moon hath not any light of her own. Oh, look, that those spots and brighter parts which by our sight may be distinguished in the moon do show the difference between sea and land in the other world. So the dark and light areas of the moon, mm. are they water and land? We still do call them seas, of course. We do, yeah. That the spots represent the sea and that the brighter parts are the land. Proposition 14 is my particular favourite, though. That it is possible for some of our posterity to find out a conveyance to this other world, and if there be inhabitants there, to have commerce with them. So can we get to the moon? And if there are people there, are we going to trade with them? Yep, exactly <laughs> right. Are we going to sell them stuff? Yeah. So let's go to Proposition 14. We'll skip through the book. There are some nice pictures in here, by the way. Someone's drawn like a hand. Yeah, he's pointing something out that's particularly important. And you do it with a hand? Yeah, you just put a little hand sign in there finger points at the important passage. Okay. Oh look, here's another hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who's drawing these little hands? Whoever's reading the book, so they're just putting in points that they think they want to remember. So <laughs> here's, a, here's a key passage. But it's very elaborate, like there's even like a little cuff and everything. Mm, yeah. How do you mark things in books that you want to remember? I don't mark things in books. I just remember. Total pro. Oh look, he's gone crazy with the hands. There's two on back to back pages. Mm. There's a big hand and a mini hand. Here it is, Proposition 14. Okay, let's take a look at this now. We'd know what we were looking for if you'd drawn a hand in there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> possibly I should have done that first. A hand in a white glove, perhaps. So he's talking about, could we get to the moon? And the first thing he says here is that in the first ages of the world, the islanders thought themselves either to be the only dwellers upon Earth, or else, if there were any other, they could not possibly conceive how they might have any commerce with them, being severed by the deep and broad sea. So he's saying that before the invention of ships, people couldn't imagine traveling across the, pl the globe. Therefore, if we could invent a ship that could get to the moon, suddenly people would want to go there. And of course, uh, uh, the art of flying is going to be necessary for that. But he also looks at, at what doubts there might be. Even if you had a ship, well, what things would you need to think of? And he says that there are chiefly three things. The first, taken from the natural heaviness of a man's body, whereby it is made unfit for the motion of ascent, together with the vast distance of that place for it. So the acceleration you need to get there, how long it would take you to get there, you need to think about these things. From the extreme 
extreme coldness of the ethereal air? Would it be cold along the way? And then the extreme thinness of it. So was there any kind of atmosphere between the Earth and the Moon? Uh, and what would you need to, to think about in travelling? It's a really nicely scientific reasoned piece, this. And he goes into things that are quite amusing, really. But he's thinking about these things. Nor can we well conceive how a man should be able to carry so much luggage with him as might serve for his viaticum in so tedious a journey. So he thinks it's going to be a long way. He thinks here, you can see, that the distance he measures and semi-diameters of the Earth, and he thinks the whole space will be about 179712, 179,000 semi-diameters. And he thinks here that you might arrive there if you could fly at 1,000 miles a day at under 180 days or half a year. That's how long he thinks it's going to take you to get to the moon. So you would actually need to take quite a lot of supplies with you. So the, the luggage thing is quite sensible. Of course, it only takes three days to get to the moon, it turns out. Yeah. But but if he could, yet he must have some time to rest and sleep in. And I believe he shall scarce find any lodgings by the way. No inns to entertain passengers, nor any castles in the air. This yeah. is great stuff. So he says here, one of the problems would be the coldness of the air. He knows that if you go up a mountain, it's cold and the air is thin. So that's the only experience they have to, to relate to this journey into the higher atmosphere. He says in some mountains it's so thin that men cannot draw their breath unless it were through some moistened sponges. He's thinking about breathing apparatus. This is my favourite passage in the book, which I think is a great one. So he's, he's talking about perfecting an invention to take you to the moon. Perfecting of such invention would be of such excellent use that it were enough not only to make a man famous, but the age also wherein he lives. So notwithstanding all these seeming impossibilities, it is likely enough that there may be a means invented of journeying to the moon. And how happy shall they be that are first successful in this attempt. And so it was. It's still 300 years away. Yeah. And he's imagining how amazing it will be to be alive when people go to the moon. Yeah, yeah. And how right he was, you know. Amazing. How is the quality of the TV? Oh, it's beautiful, Mike. It really is. Beautiful, just beautiful. OK, so this one, our next book, he is called The Consolidator. And The Consolidator is a ship that will go to the moon. So it's The Consolidator's or memoirs of sundry transactions from the world in the moon, translated from the lunar language by the author of The True Born Englishman. So this is a work of fiction. It is a work of fiction and it's uh, slightly satirical as well. And it's slightly satirical about an organisation we know quite well. The transactions in the title there, of course, refers to the philosophical transactions. And the author of this is not very flattering about the Royal Society. So the philosophical transactions is the famous journal of the Royal Society. Mm -hmm. So this fictional sundry transactions is like poking fun at that, you guys. That's right, yes. And we know that the author of the true born Englishman is one Daniel Defoe. He writes this in 1705. It says that he goes to China and he has some talk there with the local librarian. And we know librarians are highly trustworthy people, don't we, Brad? First person I speak to. Yep, that's right. And uh, the librarian there shows him the um, repository that they have full of great inventions. And the reason he says that they have such great things, including machines that can go to the moon, is that they've been talking to people on the moon and trading with them in exactly the same way that Wilkins says, maybe you could trade with them. Here, Defoe is picking up from that and saying, well, yes, you can. The Chinese have been doing it for years. So the Chinese have got all this great technology and they've got it from moon people. Yep. So here she describes the machine that's going to take him to the moon. The consolidator. Yep. And here it is. She says the composition of this engine is very admirable for, as is before noted, it is all made up of feathers and the quality of the feathers is no less wonderful than their composition. The number of feathers are just 513. An engine made of 513 feathers yeah. is what's going to take you to the moon. That's right. And he says uh, it's a chariot on the back of two vast bodies with extended wings which spread about 50 yards in breadth. Now 513 is a suspicious, suspiciously exact number, isn't it? Mm. It's actually the numbers of members of parliament that were sitting at this period and the machine here that will take you to the moon and put you into a dozing draft that throws you into a gentle slumber, dreaming all along the way, is the Houses of Parliament. So he's, he's satirising London by looking in the moon. 
This is the beginning of quite a few satires about London life and the Royal Society. The most famous one, of course, being Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, which is all about the Royal Society. All right, we'll do that one another day. <laughs> Last, not least, this one's quite old, isn't it? It is. It's in a bit of a delicate state, this one. Unlike Daniel Defoe, who's a great journalist, of course, this one's written by a great scientist. And we can see who it is here. This is the Celestial Worlds Discovered, or Conjectures Concerning the Inhabitants, Plants and Productions of the Worlds and the Planets. And this is written in Latin, helpfully translated into English from this one, by Christian Huygens, a great Dutch experimental scientist, well known as a mathematician, uh, an expert on clocks and many, many other things. So this is his kind of semi-speculative work on exobiology. All right, what are we going to find on the planets? So they, they know quite a bit about the planets by this stage, of course, because he's been observing them through uh, telescopes, he makes lenses himself, and here we have a comparative illustration of the sun, size of the sun there, with the relative sizes of the planets that were known at that period. Okay, so what Earth is Tellus. Tellus, yeah, yeah. Mercury, Venus, Tellus, Tellus Mars, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and there's the big old sun. So here we have a bit of uh, work on each of the planets. And as Huygens goes through, he thinks about the shapes of creatures that one might find on the other planets. And he tends to conclude that if there are creatures on other worlds, they would look pretty much like us. What, like Keith and Brady? Yeah, exactly right. Specific yeah. we are, so just like... Uh, pretty <laughs> much. He, he thinks they'd have the same kinds of features. So, for example, he thinks that they would have hands just the same as we do. And he's talking here, if their globe is divided like ours between sea and land, as it evidently it is, else whence could all those vapours and Jupiter proceed? So he's talking about Jupiter here. We have great reason to allow them the art of navigation. And he goes on to say, if they have ships, they must have sails and anchors, ropes, pulleys and rudders, which are of particular use in directing a ship's course against the wind. Of course they must look like humans. How could they sail their ships otherwise? Exactly right. <laughs> and uh, he does go on to say, you know, that uh, they might have things like music and science. So not only would they be like us, they'd be rather like him. They'd be natural philosophers, in fact. So it's quite fun from that point of view. And just, uh, you know, in one sense, I mean, someone like Wilkins is, is showing actually quite a good reasoned, imaginative view of what a journey to the moon would be like. Yeah. Uh, Huygens is a bit more of kind of a failure of the imagination, I think, when it comes to thinking about other planets, but, but quite entertaining for all that, I think. And yet Huygens is the name that gets his name on the probe and, yeah, and yeah, goes yeah, to other yeah, planets. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, yeah, yeah, he, he thought about it. He thought about it. They didn't send Wilkins to Saturn, did they? No, they didn't. I think they should have done. What do you think? We should, should, we, should we get a Wilkins probe going? I tell you what, Wilkins should be getting more credit for all, like, you know, the moon and Apollo stuff. When that yeah. stuff comes up, like, you know... He's nailing it. Huygens, what's he got? He's got people sailing ships on Jupiter. Yeah, I whereas know. Whereas Wilkins is like, this is, this is the problems we're going to have. This is how we're going to do it. It's going to be a great time. And he's just nailed it. So the, the campaign for the Wilkins probe starts here. I think so. I think it's time for Wilkins to get a bit more credit. Ancient documents. Check. Mysterious unopened boxes. Check. We have everything we need for an objectivity video. What have we got, Keith? What okay. have we got? Well, we have here three very large lenses. And these are lenses from aerial telescopes made in the 1680s. So you can see they are inscribed and the lenses themselves are rather nicely mounted. And these were made by Christian and Constantine Huygens, the great Dutch instrument makers and astronomers. 